Hey everybody, appreciate everybody joining another month here of our Clear Calcs Learn Hour or our webinar series. Uh, as always, I'm just gonna give us a couple minutes here to have people join um, in case they're making some coffees, running a little late, meeting a deadline. Um, we'll just give them a second here. Feel free to get settled um, as per the usual, send through um, title, where you're calling in from, the types of projects you do in the chat. And then you guys can see Matt Ward sitting here. I'll introduce him in a second here, give him a proper introduction, the one he deserves. So we'll just give it about another minute here. All right, how many do we have? We have about 34. So we'll wait just a, another minute, like I mentioned. Appreciate everybody joining. Today, as you guys can see, we'll be chatting through how to prepare residential structural calculations deliverables from our expert user, Matt Ward. Um, figure we'll go ahead and get started because we're at about 35 right now. Um, as people slowly trickle in, they could join in. So like I just mentioned, we'll be chatting through how to prepare residential structural calculations deliverables um, with a principal engineer from Ward Engineering who uses ClearCalcs, and he's gonna walk you through his process. Oops. So for anybody who's not familiar, I know most of you guys join in R, ClearCalcs is a cloud calculations software. Um, anywhere you have access to the internet, you have access to your files, open to make things non-black box, user-friendly um, to help you get your jobs done quicker and more transparent. And I am Connor, our Director of Customer Success. And without further ado, we're gonna head into the ClearCalc's Learn Hour. Here's how to ask your questions. If you guys do have any questions throughout the webinar, and I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Matt Ward. All right, sounds good, thank you. All right, so just let me know when you can see my screen. Can you see my presentation? Oh, sorry, I gotta hit the show my screen button. How about that? Yep, we got you. Thanks, Matt. All right, sounds good. All right, so you can see my screen now? Okay, sounds good. All right, so, all right, thank you everyone for joining me today. So. As Connor mentioned, I got to know Connor through using ClearCalcs over the last year or so, and it's a great software. And recently he asked if I'd be willing to give a presentation on how we do the work that we do. And I was more than happy to do that. So with that being said, that's uh, my uh, goal for today is to show you how we do the work that we do at a very high level. Um, so the name of our my presentation for today is how to prepare residential structural calculations with ClearCalcs. And just one caveat I'm gonna throw out there is that I'm gonna have to keep it very high level in order to get through my presentation within 45 minutes. So I'm not gonna go down any rabbit holes on any particular subjects. So that way we can get through this and get to questions. And if there are any further questions people wanna meet later on to discuss, I'm more than happy to do follow-up meetings as requested. So with that being said, my agenda for today, I really have two main goals. Number one is to teach you how to pre prepare a structural calculations package and number two, to teach you how to prepare a braced wall plan. And I'm gonna try to get it done in about 45 minutes or so. Here's a screenshot of structural calculations, a screenshot of braced wall plan. So the house that we're gonna be using today for our discussion is this house here that we call the Juniper. It's a single family residence that we did the engineering for for a family out in Wilton last year. It's 2,686 square feet, four bedrooms, two and a half bath. Here's a rendering of it. It's one of the houses that we have available on our website through our permit ready plan packages that we offer. And we have eight houses up there. This is one of the houses. And you can go to the website. We have 3D videos of it and renderings and all kinds of information on this particular house. So here's a front view of the house, side view of the garage, backyard view, and a dollhouse overview. So this section of the house over here is single story. And then this rectangle over here is 
more or less one and a half story, which I'll show you a cross section here in a second. So if you cut a cross section right through here, through the garage, it looks like this here. You have your garage down below, then you have this enlarged attic with a large energy hill here, creating your kind of half story up here. So that's a very quick overview of the house that we're going to be talking about for the sake of this conversation. All right, so I'm going to start by talking about the philosophy that I employ when I'm doing structural calculations. So first and foremost, anytime I'm doing structural calculations, I want to start with templates. I do not want to reinvent the wheel. OK, so I have four primary templates that I use anytime I'm starting a project. I have my Microsoft Word template. That's what I'm using for the body of my report. I have an Excel file that I'm using for tables and miscellaneous calculations. I have an Excel template for my brace wall plan calculations. And then I have an AutoCAD template, one for brace wall plan and one for shear wall plan that I use for when I create my brace wall plan and shear wall plan. I never want to have to start from scratch and go find information and work inefficiently. So those are the templates I use, which I will uh, quickly show you in a second. And the second philosophy that I use is let the template be your guide. If you're starting a project, it can be very overwhelming, not knowing where to start, where to go, what you're doing. If you use the template, you kind of start at the beginning and just kind of work your way through it. It can actually be very helpful and uh, alleviate a lot of the stress or concern. And the last philosophical point here that I'll mention here is it's easier to delete. It's easier to delete sections you don't need than it is to reinvent sections you do need. So I'll show you the template in a second. You'll see as many has many um, sections in it, which you uh, may not be applicable on any given job. So I'm going to try to pull this up right now and throw this over here on the screen. So here is the word template that I use anytime I'm starting any structural calculations, big or small, doesn't matter. And it has a whole lot of sections in here. For instance, drag trusses, girder trusses, rafters, ceiling joists. And on any given job, I may not use 90% of the information that's in here. However, it's easier to have that information in here and delete it than it is to go try to find that information in the California Residential Code or the California Building Code or wherever it may be. So for instance, I may be doing a job that doesn't have any rafters and, and does not have any ceiling choice. And which in that case, I would just delete this out of the template. But if I am using rafters or ceiling joists, it's easier to have this here and highlight it and easily justify it than it is to go find these tables and clip them out of the California Residential Code. So that's kind of the philosophy that I employ when I'm starting structural calculations. And uh, so that's one of the templates that I use right there. The other template that I use I'm only going to show two of the templates for the sake of time. The other template is here. And this is my Excel template in which I, I can use this to very quickly determine the weight of a structure by putting in geometrical information here, loading information here, information regarding the walls, and I can very quickly figure out what the weight of a structure is. Similarly, I can very easily calculate wind forces by inputting wind pressures and wind areas calculating wind forces, vertical and horizontal, and distributing those to shear walls using these tables here. So uh, there's many other tabs here, but this is essentially how I start, always starting with a template. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna quickly run you through the structural calculations that we put together for that particular house that we're talking about, the Juniper. Okay, so here are the structural calculations that we put together for that structure. So anytime I'm doing a project, I always like to start by thinking about the end in mind. I always want to work backwards. I kind of want to reverse engineer the, the structure, whatever it is I'm doing. Like what are my, I want to actually identify what are my deliverables? What is it I'm actually trying to produce? And in this case, we're actually trying to produce a PDF file, the structural calculations, as well as the brace wall plan. So very quickly here, here are the structural calculations we put together for that house. It's 30 pages. It has my lateral information, my gravity information, brace wall pan, uh, panel design, information on my girder trusses and beams, which we'll talk about later. It has the analysis of those beams, which we did here in ClearCalcs. These are the outputs from ClearCalcs. Beam one, beam two, and now a footing schedule that I get from my Excel file, justification on the perimeter footing, information on the anchorage that I used for the project, Hold downs analysis of the king studs for the garage doors, 
and the analysis, the analysis of those King studs in clear calcs. So at a very, very high level, this is a structural calculation package that we put together for that structure. So I want to show this to you so that way as I'm talking about it, you kind of have this in the back of your head. All right. I'm going to now talk about Brinks wall panel design. So when you're analyzing a structure, you, you really have two different things. You have lateral design and you have gravity design. And right now I'm gonna talk about lateral design. Okay, so for this house, we did our lateral design using a brace wall plan, not a shear wall plan, which there are two different things and I'll talk about that later. If you wanna understand brace wall plan design, it's really important to read and understand chapter six of the California Residential Code. It's pages 229 through 272, uh, which here's the residential code. I highly recommend you get it, download it, understand it. That's really the heart and soul of brace wall plan design. Well, if you don't understand that, then a lot of what I'm gonna say right now is gonna sound very, very Greek. So I, I break down brace wall plan design into four steps. So step one for me is to, de to determine your SDS value. That's your short period seismic acceleration value. And there are multiple ways that you can do that. The way that I prefer is to use this site here, ATC hazards. And so you can come here, you can type in the address. So in our case, Wilton, California, 95693. And you can go to seismic, ASCE 716, risk category two, D for default, because there's no soils report, hit print these results. <clears throat> and you'll see here, SDS equals 0 0.438. And what I do is I take a screenshot of this, I put it into my, micro, my Word template. Similarly, for wind, I can come over here to wind, hit print these results. You can see here, risk category two, the design wind speed is 94 miles per hour. Okay. So we just determined from that website that SDS is 0 0.44 G. Step two is to determine your seismic design category. All right, so the seismic design category is determined using this table here from the California Residential Code. It's determined by the SDS value. So the categories range from A to E. And something that's very important to note here is that as you read chapter six and understand chapter six, you'll see that categories A through C are all controlled by wind, whereas D0 through E are controlled by seismic. And to put it very bluntly, in categories A, B, and C, the regulations and requirements are much lower, much easier to meet, whereas in D0 through E, they can be very difficult, if not impossible to meet. So as a general rule of thumb, if I have a, category, if I have a structure in category A, B, or C, I'm definitely doing a brace wall plan. If it's D0 through E, maybe only half the time I'm able to make a brace wall plan work. So anytime I get a structure, it's in A, B, or C. In this case, it's C. You know, life is good. If it's in the other categories, not so good, it can be very difficult, you may not be able to get it to work. Step three is you create your brace wall plan using the AutoCAD template. So obviously for the sake of time, I'm not gonna create a brace wall plan during this presentation, but that's the next step is you create your brace wall plan. And I really have, there's four rules in mind that I use when I'm creating my brace wall plan. Rule number one, max spacing of brace wall line is 60 feet. So what does that mean? As you're laying out your brace wall lines, A, B, C, the maximum spacing between them cannot exceed 60 feet. And this is a graphic from the California Residential Code chapter six here. So where does that come from? It comes from this table here. So seismic bracing, seismic design categories A through C, the building type, it's detached. It says use wind, use wind bracing. Come over here, wind bracing, building type detached, maximum spacing 60 feet, no exceptions. You cannot go above that number. Whereas with seismic, there are different exceptions. So to put it just uh, very straightforward here, you cannot have a, um, you cannot have the distance of more than 60 feet between your brace wall lines. That's rule number one. Rule number two, 
the maximum spacing of brace wall panels cannot exceed 20 feet. So what does that mean? If I put a panel here, my next panel has to be within 20 feet of the end of the previous brace wall panel. So if your client wants to do 24 feet of windows and glass doors and whatnot, well, that, that won't comply. 20 foot is the max, no exceptions to that. Rule number three, max panel distance from end of a brace wall line is 10 feet. So the code, so ideally in a perfect world, you would have a panel at the beginning and end of each brace wall line. In reality, that's not always the case. The code says that your brace wall panel has to be within 10 feet of the corner. So uh, I, yeah, ideally you'd have one here, but maybe you've got a window, maybe you have a door, so you can't put a panel here. So you have to have it within 10 feet. That's rule number three. Rule number four is satisfy the minimum bracing lengths of table R602-1031. That's this table here. And don't forget you have all these adjustment factors that are stated in this table here. So what does this mean? So coming here, ultimate design wind speed, as I stated earlier for this structure, the design wind speed is 94 miles per hour, which is less than 110 miles per hour. Come over here, we have a single story house, which is illustrated by this picture here. Our brace wall line spacing, as I'll show you in the plan in a little bit, is less, <clears throat> less than 50 feet. So their space or lines are spaced 50 feet apart. I'm using the method continuously sheathed wood structural panel, which is my favorite method to use, and I highly recommend everybody else use it as well. It says I need seven feet of bracing along that line in order to comply. But don't forget, you also have all these adjustment factors over here that have to be met. So you take this, you multiply it by the adjustment factors, and that becomes your required length of bracing along that line, which I'll show you here in a minute. Hey, Step Matt, one. can I just yeah. hop in? Sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah. Just had a great question from Raju. He was just wondering if you can go back to that. Uh, that I think it was rule number three. It was the last requirement. Um, yeah. If you could just kind of explain that one more time, uh, I think that would help him really understand what that rule means. Got it. Okay, so rule number three means that if my brace wall line ends here, I need to have a panel within 10 feet of this point. Now, in a perfect world, you would always just put a panel here and you have a panel here because those panels keep your structure nice and rigid. It keeps the wall from wanting to deflect or rack. However, that's not possible because as you can see, there's windows here. So it says you have to have it within 10 feet. Now, this is true for seismic design category C. Your panel has to be within 10 feet. Now, if we were in category D0, D1, D2, it says you have to have a panel at the corners or meet, you have to have a hold down here. There's some other criteria. But basically, the general rule is that they don't want your walls to rack. That's what brace wall panels do. They keep your walls rigid. And so that's why they need to be within 10 feet of the corner. Hopefully, that helps. And that's stated yeah, in chapter six of the Okay. Rule number five okay. so, uh, satisfy the minimum lengths, which I just talked about that length requirement. And then oh, sorry. Uh, that's rule four. Okay, now step four create your brace wall calculations using the Excel template. So I have an Excel template that looks basically just like this that I use for justifying my brace wall plan design. So as I talked about, there are all these different wind adjustment factors. So you can read chapter six, read about the adjustment factors. Here are all the adjustment factors listed. So it, the end result of those is that my adjustment factor is 1.8 in both directions. So whatever value I got from that table, which you saw earlier was seven, that's gonna get multiplied by 1.8 to be what's required. So I list all my brace wall lines here, one, two, three, A, B, C. I'll show you the plan in just a second. I list my brace, bracing method, the required bracing, which I got from that table I just showed you. My total required bracing is this value times the adjustment factor. So seven times 1.8 is 12.6. And then I actually provided 16. So I input the number 16 here. And then this cell here checks, is this value greater than that value? Yes. And then I manually update these. Did I comply with the 20 foot max spacing? Yes. Did I get a panel within 10 feet of the beginning end of a brace wall line, which the question was referring to? Yes. So make that good. So that these are the calculations that justify my brace wall lateral design for the house. So actually not a lot of calculations. It doesn't take up a lot of space, but this is ultimately the calculations that do the complete justification for the lateral design of the structure. So I'm going to quickly show you 
the brace wall plan uh, without putting without too much time into it. So here is the brace wall plan that we submitted for that structure. So as you can see, I have three lines in this direction, A, B, C, and then I have three lines in this direction, one, two, and three. And as I talked about earlier for line C, uh, spaced 50 feet apart, it, we got the number seven and times 1.8 was 12.6. Along this line, I have four feet here, four feet here, four feet here, four feet here. So that's 16 feet of bracing that I have along that line. So I met my bracing check. That was one of my checks. What were my other checks? My other checks were I need to have a panel within 10 feet of the beginning and end, which was that question was referring to. I have a panel here. That's at the beginning. So that works. That checks out. I have a begin a panel here. So that checks out as well. Then my other checks were I don't have any gaps of more than 20 feet. So from here to here is less than 20 feet. From here to here is less than 20 feet. So those were my primary checks, and they all check out. That same philosophy is holds true for all of these brace, all of the other five brace wall lines for the structure, which I'm not going to talk about for the sake of time. So I can get through this. So those are the steps for doing brace wall panel design. Now, a lot could be said about this topic here about brace wall plan design versus shear wall plan design. A lot of designers out there only design shear wall plans and they do not design brace wall plans. In my opinion, if you're only designing shear wall plans, you're really missing out. There are a lot of benefits to designing brace wall plans. Uh, number one, they're much easier calculations. You can see the calculations I just showed you. They were not cumbersome. They're not overwhelming. Number two, you don't have to be a civil engineer to make brace wall plans. And I would also say there's also a much lower cost if you can make a lateral design work using a brace wall plan as opposed to a shear wall plan. If you notice something about the brace wall plan I just showed here, there are no hold downs. I did not use a single hold down for this house, which to someone out there who only designed shear wall plans, that might sound extremely crazy to say that this house has no hold downs, but it's true. If you're in seismic design category C, you can oftentimes design a house using no hold downs. Um, whereas if you design, you could design the same house using 30 hold downs if using a shear wall plan. And so as I stated earlier, if, if I'm in category A, B, or C, 100% of the time I'm doing a brace wall plan. The other categories, maybe it's reduced about 50% of the time. All right, so now I'm gonna completely switch gears from lateral design to talking now about gravity load design. So the first step, in gravity load design for me is to just list my gravity load. So you can see here this table, which comes from my Excel template. I just start by putting in my loads here. I get most of my loads straight from my trust documents. So here's a screenshot of the trust documents for this house. Top cord live load 20 PSF, top cord dead load 14, bottom cord dead load seven, bottom cord live load is always zero. I take those loads, I put them into my Excel spreadsheet, I also put in my wall loading information. So for this house, we're using fiber cement lap siding, total weight of the walls, nine PSF. And notice I'm not calculating the weight of the house. I'm only listing the weights of the materials in PSF, uh, which is something you'll see other people calculate the entire weight of the structure. I do not do that. And there's no snow load. Number two, identify the girder trusses. Okay, so girder trusses are the most important trusses on any house design. They're kind of, I consider them like super trusses. They're multiply trusses for which other trusses are framing into them. So for this house, there are three girder trusses, D2, D3, and F3. And you can see how these work. So D2 is going this direction. It has another truss here that frames in perpendicular to it and other trusses that frame in perpendicular to that truss. So you can see that this truss is picking up a whole lot of load. Same with over here with truss F3. You have these trusses that are coming in perpendicular to it. So it's kind of like a heavy duty, multiply, super truss. Those are the ones you really need to be concerned about, not the common trusses. The common trusses aren't gonna give you the problem. It's your girder trusses. You need to identify all those. So for the sake of this example, I'm only gonna talk about girder truss F3 and how I use that in my Excel spreadsheets. So F3, it's a two ply truss. And here are my reactions down there. 
Okay, so I've, I've identified my girder trusses. So I'm gonna list those girder trusses here in my Excel spreadsheet. So like I said, our girder trusses were D2, D3, F3. Sorry. All right, so I've listed them. I've put that they each have two ply. I list their joint number. And then in this cell here, I'm listing what the reaction is from the trust document. So keep this in mind, 5,417 and then 5,483. Those are the reactions from those girder trusses. So that's step three. And you'll see here, those numbers I just said, here's the girder truss, reactions, 5,417, 5,483. Those are the numbers I put into the spreadsheet. Step four, which is what we're showing here in red, list the post slash cripple studs and the footing size will populate itself in red. And for beginners, I recommend sizing posts and footings in clear calcs. Okay, so how does this work? I've, I've put in that reaction of 5,417. Then I have to come over here and I have to identify, well, what post is gonna be underneath that girder truss? So from experience and using clear calcs, I identified that I'm gonna put in a four by six dug for a number two post there. And this cell here auto populates with the footing size. So based on that reaction divided by 1500 pounds per square foot is the required area. It calculates what size footings needed in order to support that load right there. So, and like I'm saying here, my recommendation if you're a beginner, don't, don't size your posts and footings using an Excel spreadsheet. Do it all in clear calcs. Once you become familiar with it and you can write the code to size your footings, then that's great. I do this just for the sake of saving time and making my reports a little bit shorter. I do this in Excel. Step number five, list the beams that you will analyze. Use discretion, do not analyze all the beams. Okay, so we started at the top, we analyzed our girder trusses, we got the reactions. Now we're gonna identify the beams that we're going to actually include in our report. So a house may have 50 headers or a bunch of uh, patio beams or whatnot. You do not want to provide a calculation for every single header or every single beam to, for that house. You wanna try reducing it down to two or three or four beams. And so that's a bit of an art, which I'm not going to get into that too much, but basically you want to try to identify the beams for which if you do the calculations for those beams, all of the other beams for the structure are justified by default because they have a more conservative loading or span length or both. So for this structure, I've identified two beams that I'm going to do calculations for. Number one, beam number one is the garage door header. It's 20 feet long. Beam number two is the front porch beam, which I believe is 11 feet long. So I just identify those. I put those into my Excel spreadsheet here. That's step five. Step six is I'm going to analyze those beams that I identified in step five in clear calcs. Okay, so this is where we actually start using clear calcs now. So beam number one that I'm talking about is this garage door header, 20 foot long garage door header. And here's a screenshot of it from the roof framing plan. And beam number two is the front porch beam. It's a six by 10 dug for number one. So just to give you an idea of what that looks like in the plans. So your, your beams will typically be shown on your roof framing plan. So here's the roof framing plan for the house. Over here is this garage door header spanning 20 feet. It's a five and a quarter by 14 parallel PSL. Beam number two over here. Six by 10 dug for number one, this patio beam right here. Those are the two beams I'm gonna analyze. I'm not going to analyze every other beam for this house, every other header. That would be Matt. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry for interrupting here. Just got a great question from uh, another Matt, Matthew Robles. Uh, he had a question. He just said in his local area, he's found that the building officials pretty much require every beam in their home to have a calculation. He was just curious, you know, just knowing that state by state, county by county, it differs. Does your local jurisdiction just need kind of those worst case beams? Yeah, just worst case scenarios. So most of the jurisdiction I work with, Sacramento County, San Joaquin County, Amador, City of Sacramento. And no, they don't require a calculation for every beam in the structure. But you do need to have every beam accounted for kind of by default. So for instance, 
this this beam right here is six by ten dug for number one. Okay, well, all of my headers for the house are six by ten dug for number one. So as long as this is the worst case six by ten dug for number one, then we're good because this beam here will now cover the design of all of the rest. Whereas contrast that with if I said all my headers for the house were six by ten dug for number two or six by eight dug for number two. Okay, that's a different story because now this calculation does not cover those. So I purposely make my headers match my patio beams, that being one of the reasons. So that way I don't have to provide a whole bunch of calculations. Number two, it makes life easier on the framer, not having many different grades and many different sizes of beams to order and have out at the site. And then perhaps you put the wrong beam in and now you gotta pull the thing out. Uh, same with garage door headers. So like this one here being five and a quarter by 14, if there was another garage door over here that was spanning, it was only a 10 foot garage door, I would still use that exact same grade just to make life easy on everyone. So hopefully that answers the question, but no, you don't need to go do an account for every single beam in the house. All right, thanks, Matt, appreciate it. Yeah, and I just realized I was pointing at a screen that you guys cannot see, so <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> so yeah, I was trying to, yeah, what I was trying to show is this six by 10 here, justifying, actually, wait, okay, yeah, I have to put it here. I keep confusing myself here. Okay, so now you can see my roof framing plan. Okay, yeah, so this six by 10 here justifies the six by 10s for the rest of the house. Same with if I had a second garage door over here, I would use that same grade right there. So, sorry about that. All right, so here are the two beams that I'm going to analyze that will provide the justification for my beams. Beam one, beam two. And I now am going to jump over to clear calcs. Okay, so this is clear calcs here. All right, so over here is kind of the standard project details and member information. And then down here is where it actually lists the calculations that you have for this particular project. So as you can see here, I have beam one, B1, garage door header, and then B2, front porch beam. So I'll start with the garage door header. Okay, so like I said earlier, that I have my name, I can name it up here. Um, for me, I like providing detailed names here. I do not like just calling beams beam one, beam two. No, I want the plan checker to know exactly what it is. It's the garage door header. And it's a five and a quarter by 14 paralam. It's one ply. You know, you could change it like if you had a beam that was multiply. It's one ply, it's spanning 20 feet. The top is braced by the trusses. My bearing length at each end is three and a half inches. Over here, I know this looks busy and super complicated. However, it's actually pretty straightforward. That is my loading from my trusses. So that garage door header is supporting trusses A7 and A8. And it, trusses are two feet on center. So it goes two, four, six, all the way to 20. And then here are my reactions. So if you look at the trust documents, my reactions are 449 pounds for dead and 539 pounds for live. So I'm placing my reactions from my trusses on top of my beam. So you can see it gets pretty busy, but it's pretty straightforward. And we're bending about the strong axis always. We always include our self weight. The live load is based on occupancy. And this is other standard information here. Most importantly, the deflection criteria from the California Building Code. I want to make sure you got the correct deflection criteria in there. And then you see up here, we're at 50%. So the bending capacity, it's only using 50% of the allowable bending capacity. So the beam checks out perfectly fine. No issues there. I'm gonna jump over to beam two, which is that front porch beam. As I stated earlier, it's a six by 10 dug for number one. It's one ply, it's spanning 11 feet. The top is braced by the trusses that are landing on it. So that's good and keep it from buckling. I'm modeling it as pinned pinned. 
And here are the trusses, it's supporting trusses M2. Again, trusses are two feet on center, so zero to 10. Here are the reactions from the trust documents, 200 dead, 200 roof live. Other standard information, most important, the deflection. And you see it's only at 28% bending capacity, which is what I'd fully expect. I would not expect that patio beam to have a high utilization ratio because it, there's not much load on it and it's not spanning very far. And you know, if I wanted to change this to say, a, I wanted to change it to um, grade number two, I could do that. Um, but this kind of goes back to that question that was just asked about, oh, do you have to provide calcs for every beam? Well, if I change this to number two, well, then now I need to provide justification for those all those other uh, beams because now they're not the grades are not matching. So I try to make consistent grades and sizes of beams to eliminate multiple calculations. All right, so <clears throat> those are the that, those are the calculations for the two beams in ClearCalx, very quickly and high level. Hey Matt, uh, just a question here. Actually, as watching you go, and then uh, Ryan asked a question. Um, I'm just curious from a user research perspective, do you think if we as ClearCalx added like a duplicate or copy load feature, that would be very useful to you? Because it looks like just looking at your workflow there, that would help quite a bit. Absolutely, 100% yes. Because yes, you do. right now you do have to manually put all of these in. Like if I could just do one here and hit copy, 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 and change just the, in that case, you just change the location of X, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Yes, that would be very helpful. Awesome. Yeah, I'll be chatting with the dev and engineering team about that. Uh, appreciate it. And thanks, Ryan, for the question. Yep. Sounds good. All right. Okay, so back to the presentation here. So step seven, insert clear calc beam reactions and post sizes into the table. Uh, footing size will populate. So I think I know. Okay. So, so what we do here in step seven is I analyze beam one and I analyze beam two. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the reactions from clear calcs and put them into these gray cells here. So if I go look at beam one, that garage door header, uh, actually, sorry, uh, yeah, I input into the white cells. So into the white cells, I put my dead reaction for that beam was 2,640 pounds. My roof live load reaction was 2,960 pounds. I just realized you can't see my little hand. I need to use the laser pointer. Okay, so those are the reactions from clear calcs. Then the Excel spreadsheet is going to add those together to create the dead plus roof live load reaction. Then it's going to size my footing appropriately. And then I'm going to state here what the column is that's underneath that beam. So, and again, same thing. If you're a beginner at this, I don't recommend you using an Excel spreadsheet for calculating your columns or your footings, do those in clear calcs until you have a good grasp of that. So One thing I'll mention, uh, just for everybody watching, I know most of you are familiar uh, with clear calcs, but like Matt just mentioned, um, I'd recommend, if you're familiarizing yourself with clear calcs, definitely check out that load linking feature, because if you get to the end of uh, step six or seven, whichever it was, and you designed your beam, um, you could easily just kind of link that onto a six by six dug for a number two post and then link that onto a, a footing calculator. So that way you can kind of track that load path down um, just to, to Matt's point there. Yeah, and I actually do have that in my report and I'm gonna actually show that exactly what you just stated. Yeah, so that is step seven there where you're getting your footing sizes and your post sizes, which I'm gonna show how to do that in clear calcs as well. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to go back to clear calcs and show how to do exactly what Connor just stated. Okay, sorry for beating sorry. you to it. Yeah, no, <laughs> that, was, that was perfect. <laughs> I didn't even tell you I was going to do this and you nailed it. All right, All right so here's the front porch beam that we just talked about. So to show you where this is and kind of give you and understanding we're talking about this beam right here 
So a beam is supported by a column, and then under the column, you have a footing. So I'm going to show you how you can use load linking to size that column as well as the footing, which I use my Excel spreadsheet just to save time, but you should definitely do it in ClearCalx. All right, so here's the beam. We already analyzed the beam. We're done with that. Now we move on to the column. So I have column C2, front patio column. And I put in parentheses, not in a report because it's not in my report. It's just for informational sake, demonstration. Okay, so the column is a six by six, Doug fir number two. It's single ply. The length of the column is nine feet, four inches approximately. And it's not braced in any direction. I'm modeling it as pinned at the base and a roller at the top. And then here it's showing the load linked beam reactions from beam two, which I just talked about. So this is actually my favorite feature of ClearCalx right here is I can load link those reactions from the beam and place those at the top of the column. So that way, as my beam updates, say I change my loading or I change the length or I change anything, it's going to automatically come back here and update this reaction that's on top of the column. So how do you do that? So you hit link here and you come back here and you find that front porch beam support one. And you can see the reaction is 1,380 pounds. Then come here and load link the other end and front porch beam. So you need the second end as well. You need two ends because uh, I'll just quickly show this. Any given column has two beam reactions. So here's a column that has a reaction from this beam over here, it has the right side reaction from this beam and the left side reaction from this beam. So you always need to put two reactions on a column, depending on how you do things. So there are the two reactions. So those are your gravity loads. And then as far as lateral distributed loads, a lot could be said on this topic, but what I'll just say is that generally speaking, the lateral loads for the house are being taken out of the house by the braced wall panels, not by the columns. So I'm typically not sizing my columns to resist any wind or seismic loads. Additionally, I'm modeling my columns as pinned pinned and a pin pin column has no stiffness by definition. So they're not laterally, they're not lateral so, uh, resisting elements. So I'm really not putting any lateral load on them. However, I always do put some amount of lateral load on them just to show that they can provide, can support some or resist some. So in this case, I'm putting 10 pounds per square foot of earthquake load, 10 pounds per square foot of wind load with a tributary width of one foot. So that comes out to 10 pounds per linear foot of wind load and 10 pounds per linear foot of seismic load. And a lot could be said on that topic, but I'll just leave it at that as far as lateral loading for columns for porches. And here's other inputs that you can adjust. And here's the default deflection limit, which is already pre-programmed in here. And so that's one of the cool things I like about ClearCalc, and I'll talk about this in a second as well, is that it already has a lot of predefined criteria built into this based on how you're using that particular column. So this, I didn't put this number 240 in here, it was already there. And I'll talk about that in later steps. So you can see that that column checks out just fine. It's only at 14%. Then we're gonna move, then we're gonna analyze the footing that's underneath that column. So just just the same as we took the reactions from the beam and put them on the column, we're gonna take the reactions from the column and put them on the footing. So here, footing one under front patio column, not in the report. So here's my footing. I have it as one and a half feet wide, one and a half feet long, 12 inches thick. It's reinforced concrete. I always want reinforcement in there. Minimum compression strength is 2,500 PSI. Our column is a six by six, so that's five and a half by five and a half. Base plate, we're using a CBSQ 6.6, so that's six and six. And the bear, allowable bearing pressure without a report is 1,500 pounds per square foot. So another standard information regarding soil. We're using 40 KSI steel because we're using number fours and we're using three each way at bottom. 
three, number four is each way at bottom. No top reinforcement. Okay, so similarly here, you can load link that column. So come here, I hit link. I can go find that column, which is column C2 and location zero. So this is the bottom of the column. It has a vertical reaction of 2,600 pounds. Click that. And so now you can see here, C2 front patio. So it has all the reactions from that column now on the footing. So with that, so what does that do? It saves you from having to go to the beam, write down the reactions, then go take those reactions, put them on the column, then write the reactions from the column, put those on the footing. So it's a really nice feature. And you can see the footing is at 87% of bearing capacity. So 87% of the 1500 PSF, which is the allow code allowable. So that's good. We're happy with that. So there, that's how you load link the beam to the column, column to the footing. And then here, I'll just quickly talk about connections. So most importantly is this table here, R60231. So that's in the California Residential Code in the first couple pages here of chapter six. So here's this table here, the most important table in terms of connections. Basically it specifies how to connect every piece of wood to every other piece of wood. And as far as like uh, special things that I would use Simpson H1s for connecting my trusses to my top plates and hold downs. So I'm either using DTT2Zs or HDU2s. And as you saw on this project, we didn't use any hold downs at all. And I'm going to talk about here some of my favorite features. Okay, so some of my favorite features here is the member selector. So like, let's say I'm trying to size a beam. Well, under the member selector, it'll bring up a screen like this that'll show you multiple beams that could be used as well as their passing or failing percentage. So you see like this particular beam, 450%. Okay, that's an obvious fail, it's red. When you come down here, all right, the bigger beam is now 62%. So I really like this feature because maybe you're trying to like make the beam very, very safe and you want everything green, but maybe another beam you're like, well, we can cut it a little bit closer. I'm okay with yellow. I'm okay with being around 95%. So I really like that feature. And this feature here, I don't know what other people call it, but this is the name I came up with it. I call it in calc load manipulation and no need for post-processing trust reactions in Excel when optimizing beam design. So uh, this is something I just realized was actually available just like a month ago, actually. So I'll show you what that means to me, how I use it. So let's say, so let's talk, we're talking about that front porch beam right now. Okay. Uh, let's say truss M2. Now let's say I went to the truss reactions and for truss M2, the truss reaction was a thousand pounds. So that's, so initially I might start off here by saying, okay, the truss reaction is a thousand pounds. So I'm going to do a thousand pounds divided by two for my dead load and a thousand pounds divided by two for my roof live load. Okay. So 500 and 500. Now let's say that by now I know that the trust is design, the trust company is designing for 15 pounds per square foot of roof dead load. And I know in reality they're doing asphalt shingles. So the roof dead load is only five PSF, not 15. So I might want to reduce that load because I know it's super conservative. So I might want to reduce it by multiplying it by five divided by 15. And now it's going to reduce it down to 167 as opposed to the 500. And I use this feature all the time now because I don't want to go oversizing beams unnecessarily when it's a detriment to the client. You know, I want to actually reduce the loads to what they are actually are in real life. Sometimes, just depends. Um, sorry, I should have been a thousand. Okay, similarly down here with roof live load, I know the trust company is designing trusses for 20 pounds per square foot. But I know that the California Residential Code says I can use 16 pounds per square foot when the pitch is greater than 4 and 12. So I might want to take this and multiply it by 16 divided by 20. 
and get that down to 400. Or maybe in this case, our pitch of our roof was a 10 and 12. So I know in reality, you're not gonna have 20 PSF on a 10 and 12 pitch. The code says you can reduce that, I think it's like 12. So maybe I wanna reduce that roof live load down to 300. So I really like this feature because I can manipulate the loads right here in ClearCalx. Uh, prior to a month ago, I actually used to always do this in Excel. So I'd create an Excel table where I'd go in there and I'd put, okay, what's the trust load? What's my name manipulator, blah, 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 blah. And then take that, put it in here. But now I need to do it right in here. I love it. So I use that feature a lot when I'm trying to optimize a, a beam design. And next feature here, the simple traffic light indicators. So I really like the green, yellow, red feature. That's really nice. I can very quickly tell if something's passing, failing, how close I am. I can optimize a lot easier. I think, it, you know, colors, nice feature. And the next three uh, the next feature here uh, beams and columns have subcategories okay so let me show you what this is so let's say i'm adding a column or so adding a calculation here wood beam asd so what's really cool i really like is that it has multiple categories of how that beam's used so how is that beam being used is it being used as a rafter a ridge beam a deck beam a deck joist there's many ways a beam could be used and depending on how which one you select it's going to give you inputs that are specific to that application so if i say a rafter it's going to give me inputs that are specific and ask me questions that direct my thinking so it might it's going to ask me well what's the pitch of that rafter what's the length of the rafter then well, what's the spacing of the rafter? So it kind of like makes it dummy proof in a sense. Like it kind of makes it easier for you as opposed to if you only had one, one thing that's just a wood beam. So other softwares that I've had will just simply have wood beam. It does not break it down into multiple categories. And then you have to do all the thinking on your end. This takes a lot of the thinking out of it. The other feature that I really like is the load linking. So I already discussed load linking. To me, that's a huge time savings. Other software that I've used does not have load linking. And then every time you manually have to get the reactions from a beam and then write it down and switch it to the column, column to the footing, you have the opportunity to make mistakes in terms of maybe you wrote down the wrong load or maybe you put down the wrong direction and used a positive sign and you should have used a negative sign or vice versa. So the load linking is wonderful. I love it. And then the last feature I'll talk about here is what I call auto update of load linked items. And so you can know immediately if something else is going to fail based on loading that you change on a completely different item. So for instance, the front porch beam, okay, so beam two. So like I showed you earlier, the front porch beam is connected to the column, which is connected to the footing. So if I come here to my front porch beam, I can come here to my loading and play around with it. And let's say I, I made a mistake and, Oh, the, the loading here is not 167 pounds. Maybe it's 10,000 pounds, for instance, which is not realistic, but let's just see what happens. So it should immediately tell me that, okay, the beam's going to fail. And you can see this little gear right here turning, and this gear right here turning, and this gear here turning. So these are updating. So it's updating the column because it knows the column's supporting that beam, which just got a higher load. So this will probably fail. Oh, the footing just failed. So it just told me the footing failed, which is great. That's very, very good information. Now I know that uh, something's going to have to change here. I cannot have that amount of load on the beam because I might be in a situation where the beam passes, but the column with the footing fails. And so I like the fact that I can see all three at the same time and know where everything's at by changing the loading on one thing. So for instance, right now this column's at 73%, it just updated, but the footing failed. So, and the beam failed. So there, that's an example of how the load linking between the three can all be seen at one time and understood very quickly how you need to react and how you need to then change something. And then, Quickly, I'll just say here, the template files I talked about, they're available on our online store, so you can go there and check them out. They're available there. 
And then I'll just end by paying homage to a great professor that inspired me to love structural engineering, Dr. David Fletcher. Here's my contact information. If anybody wants to do a more detailed discussion on anything I talked about, I'm more than happy. And with that being said, I'll open it up to questions and to Connor. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate it, Matt Ward. Um, thank you. Thank everybody for joining. Um, Matt, like I mentioned before, we kind of hopped on live. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time to do this um, for me and the ClearCalcs team. As you know, and as a lot of other ClearCalcs users know, probably the number one question I get during demos is, you know, really closing that gap. You know, how do we take this online software that's doing calculations and really picture, you know, this is being used to design real physical homes. So I uh, really appreciate it, Matt. Um, what I'm going to do is just share my screen once I find myself on the screen sharing thing. So what we will do is just hand it over to questions. Another thing I wanted to bring up, there we go, is our Built with Clear Calcs challenge that we're gonna be doing over the holidays. Um, wanted to, like I just mentioned, um, kind of continue to build this community and allow everybody to you know, show off, showcase what you've been building with Clear Calcs, and then also allow you guys to see what other users in the ClearCalcs community are building. Um, so we'll be sending out an email about this to follow up the webinar with this webinar recording as well, but just wanted to preface this because I think it'll be a great fun thing to do throughout the holidays. All right. And then open it up for questions. Um, I did get, thank you, Laurent. Uh, Laurent, who's our head of North American Engineering content said thanks. John Stanton said thanks. Matt, I do have a question from Matthew Robles. Um, you brought up the connection schedule in the California Residential Code. He was just curious if, like, what the main differences are between that and the IRC or IBC, if any. Yeah, I've been asked that question. I've never gone line by line to compare the two of them, but I think essentially they're probably the same. Yeah, so in California, we don't use the IBC. We use the California Residential Code and the California Building Code, which are derived from the International Residential Code and the International Building Code. So we don't use those codes exactly, but California's version of them. And yeah, my understanding from the things I've actually checked and looked at, they've always been the same, but I've never checked every single item. Um, but the plan checkers will definitely call you on that. If you put the California Residential Code fastening schedule onto the plans for a commercial project, they'll tell you put the CBC attachment schedule on there, even though it may not be any different. All right, appreciate it, Matt. And great question, Matthew. Um, kind of to echo what Matt just said, Matt and Matt, um, do encourage you if you are in California and you are using either CBC or CRC, um, just use your engineering judgment there and kind of look side by side IRC versus uh, CRC just to make sure you're taking into account any major differences. Uh, hopefully, like Matt mentioned, your, your building official or permit reviewer will notice that, but we're all human, so um, definitely use your engineering judgment there. A great question. Um, yeah, the rest are just, I appreciate all you guys can send them through the, fine, the kind words. Matt, I'll have to send you all the, the thank you and amazing jobs that everybody's saying. Uh, so no real questions here. That just means you did a great job doing the webinar. <laughs> Very thorough. Again, we really appreciate it um, for me and the entire ClearCalcs team. Thank you everybody for joining. We'll be sending out a follow-up email um, feel free to reach out to Matt, like he mentioned, if you have any additional questions. And then we will also be touching base on that Built with Clear Calcs photo challenge just to allow you all to showcase what you've been doing in Clear Calcs and hopefully close that loop for everybody to, to remember that these calculations we're doing online on our cloud-based platform are resulting in real physical homes being built. That's, that's super exciting to remember as we're doing them. So 
Matt, if you don't mind, um, Raju, who's had a couple questions, was just wondering if you could share your screen again and just show your contact info, if that's okay with you. Yeah, all right. Uh, yeah, do you need to let me show everything? Yeah, just change that. Okay. And then also wary of, I know you're a busy guy and everybody's busy here, especially with the holidays coming up. So um, don't want to put you on the spot here, but appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, no worries. Uh, yeah. Oh man, sorry. No, all good, all good. Uh, so, all right, can you see it? Yep, we got it, that's perfect. Okay. A beautiful cool. pick of your kids as well. My inspirations, yeah. Yep. All right. Well, appreciate it, everybody. I'm gonna let everybody go because we're at time here and I know everybody's got places to be, deadlines to meet. So enjoy the rest of your day. And Matt, thanks again. Uh, I'll be in touch right after this. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Bye, Connor. Bye, right, Thanks, guys. Bye.